The Deal Lords Book of Greek Myths, Part 8. Selene, Pan, Echo, Syrinx, and the Wild and Terrible Centaurs. In Selene's magic light, river gods rose from silvery streams to inspect their riverbeds, and hills trembled under the hooves of the wild centaurs. Laughing nymphs and bleeding satyrs danced to the music of Pan, god of nature, master of them all. Pan. Pan, the great god of nature, was not a handsome god. He had goat's legs, pointy ears, a pair of small horns, and he was covered all over with dark, shaggy hair. He was so ugly that his mother, a nymph, ran away screaming when she first saw him. <coughs> but his father, Hermes, was delighted with the strange looks of his son. He carried him up to Olympus to amuse the other gods, and they all laughed and took him to their hearts. They called him Pan and sent him back to the dark woods and stony hills of Greece as the great god of nature. <clears throat> he was be to be the protector of hunters, shepherds, and curly fleece sheep. Pan was a lonely and moody god. When he was sad, <clears throat> he went off by himself and hid in a cool cave. If a wanderer happened to come upon him and disturb him in his retreat, he would let out a scream so bone-chilling that whoever heard it took to his heels and fled in fear that they had called Pan. In a fear, they called Panic. But when Pan was in a good mood, and that was mostly on moonlit nights, he cavorted through glades and forests and up steep mountain slopes playing on his shepherd's pipe, and nymphs and satyrs followed, dancing behind him. Sweet and unearthly were the tunes that floated over the hills. The satyrs much resembled their master Pan, but they were mischievous and good for nothing except for chasing nymphs. Old satyr Celian were fat and too lazy to walk. They rode about on donkeys, but they often fell off since they were fond of drinking wine. The light-footed nymphs were always, who always looked young, though some of them were very old in years. Their lifespan was so long that they were almost immortal. They lived 10,000 times longer than man. They were water nymphs and nymphs of mountains and glens. There were nymphs who lived in trees and nymphs who lived in springs. When a tree grew, grew old and rotted, the nymphs who lived in it moved to another tree of the same kind. A woodchopper about to fell a healthy tree must remember first to ask for permission of the tree nymph. If he did not, she might send out a swarm of bees to sting him, or she might turn the axe in his hand so it would cut his own leg instead of the tree trunk. A thirsty hunter must never drink from a spring without asking the water nymph's permission. If he ignored the nymph, she might send a venomous water snake to bite him, or she might poison the water and make him sick. River gods, too, had to be asked before anyone took water from the river. They were usually helpful and friendly to men and willingly shared their water. But woe to the one who tried to carry off the water to ni water nymph daughters. They would rush out of the river beds and charge him in full river god rage. They were dangerous opponents for they grew ox horns on their heads and could change their shape at will. Zeus himself feared their rage, and Pan and the satyrs kept well out of their way, though Pan liked all nymphs and fell in love with many of them. Echo was one of the nymphs with whom Pan fell in love. She was a gay nymph who chattered and prattled all day long and never kept quiet long enough for Pan to win her with his music and poetry. One day, Hera came down from Olympus to look for Zeus. She suspected that he was playing with the nymphs, but Echo detained her so long with her idle chatter that Zeus, who really was there, and was able to sneak away. Hera, in a rage, punished Echo by taking her from her the gift of forming her own words. From then on, poor Echo could only repeat the words of others. Now, at last, Pan thought he could win her for, by his words. But before he had a chance, she had lost her heart to another. He was a narcissist, and he was so handsome that every girl and every nymph who met him fell in love with him. Unfortunately, he liked nobody but himself. Echo trailed silently behind Narcissus as he hunted in the woods, 
hoping to hear an endearing word from him that she could repeat. But it never so much as noticed her. At last, towards nightfall, they came to a quiet pool, and as Narcissus and Circe bent down to drink, suddenly he stopped and stared, for in the mirror surface of the water, he saw the handsomest face he'd ever seen. He smiled, and the handsome face smiled back. Joyfully he nodded, and so did the stranger in the water. I love you, said Narcissus to the handsome face. I love you, repeated Echo eagerly. She stood behind him, happily to be able to speak to him at last. But Narcissus never saw nor heard her. He was spellbound by the handsome stranger in the water. He did not know that it was his own image that he had fallen in love with. And he sat smiling at himself, forgetting to eat, forgetting to drink, until he wasted away and died. Hermes came and led him down to the realm of the dead, but where he had been sitting, the lovely Narcissus flower, Narcissus flower sprang up. Echo stood behind the flower and grieved and pined until she too faded away. Nothing was left of Echo but her voice, which to the day can be heard nameless, senselessly repeating the words of others. Pan grieved for a while, but then another pretty nymph crossed his path and forgot all about Echo. Her name was Syrinx. Syrinx ran away from Pan. She thought he was so ugly. Pan chased after her, and to escape from him, she changed herself into a reed. She stood among hundreds of other reeds on the river bank, and Pan couldn't find her. As he walked through the reed patch, sighing and looking for her in vain, the wind blew through the reed. They swayed and bent and made a plaintive whistling sound. Pan listened enchanted. Thus you and I shall always sing together, he said. He cut ten reeds into unequal lengths and tied them together and made the first panpipe. He called the new instrument his syrinx, for every time he played on it, he thought he heard the melodious voice of his beloved nymph. Again, Pan was lonesome, and he retreated to his cool cave deep in the woods and seared, scared away all passers-by with his unearthly screams. Splendid Apollo himself fared no better than Pan, for he fell in love with a nymph called Daphne. Daphne had a cold heart, and she vowed never to marry and when Apollo wooed her, she would not listen to the sound of his golden lyre and ran away. As she was fled, as she fled, she was lovelier still, with her golden hair streaming behind her, and Apollo could not bear to lose her. He set off in pursuit, beseeching her to stop. Daphne ran towards the bank of the river that belonged to her father, the river god Landon. Calling to him to save her from her pursuer, Landon had no time to rise out of his riverbed and come to his daughter's rescue. But the moment Daphne's toes touched the sand of the riverbank, he changed them into roots. Apollo, who was close behind her, caught up with her, but instead he threw his arms around her, his arms, her arms changed to the branches, her lovely head into a climbing tree, and she became a laurel. Still inside the hard bark, Apollo could hear the beating of Daphne's frightened heart. Apollo carefully broke off some twigs and made a wreath of the shining leaves. Fair nymph, he said, you would not be my bride, but at least content to be my tree, and your leaves shall crown my brow. Ever after, the greatest honor an artist or a hero could be given was to be crowned with a wreath from Apollo's sacred tree, the laurel. Daphne would rather be an, an unmoving tree than the bride of the great god, Apollo, but all the other nymphs loved to sit at his feet, and listened to his enchanting music, and were very honored when he or any of the other Greek gods chose one of them as a bride. The Wild and Vulgar Centaurs The Wild and Vulgar Centaurs did not honor any of the gods. They were half men and half horse, as cunning as wild men, and as savage as untamed horses. They had inherited the worst disposition of both. The first centaurs had come tumbling out of a cloud that their father, Azaxon, king of the Lapthra people, had married, mistaking it for God, the goddess Hera. Zeus had created the cloud to test the ungodliness of the wicked king who wanted to carry off Hera. Zion had severely was severely punished for his ungodliness. He was condemned to whirl about forever in the underworld, tied to a flaming wheel. But his offspring, the centaurs, remained on earth as a scourge to the Lapia people. The centaurs lived without law and order, storming over fields, 
trampling crops and carried off the Latvia women, and there they ate raw meat. The young centaurs were no better than their elders. They were poorly brought up by the parents who kicked them and spanked them and left them to fend for themselves. There was one centaur who was kind and wise, and he was fond of children. His name was Chiron. Though he looked like the other centaurs, he wasn't related to them at all. He was the son of Cronus, the titan, and was immortal. Chiron was famous for the greatest, as the greatest teacher in Greece. Kings brought their small sons to him so he could raise them in the true spirit of heroes. In his quiet cave on Mount Pelion, he taught them manly sports and how to use the healing herbs of the earth and how to read the stars in the sky. All his pupils returned to their homes, exceeding their fathers in courage and kindness. One day, Apollo brought to Chiron his little mortal son, Asilophus. His mother, Alapia the princess, had died, and Apollo asked Chiron to take raise the boy. Part 8. 